What's up? Hey, today we are talking all things labor, delivery, and answering your juiciest questions about literally pushing out a baby. This is a follow-up video to my birth story that I shared not too long ago. I did end up achieving, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. I got the unmedicated minimal intervention home birth. That was a surprise little tidbit that I had been planning for. So if you haven't watched that video yet, I mean, if you're watching this, you're probably nosy. It's very in-depth. It's got all the details you might want to know about how that went for me. So I will link that down below. Before we get into it though, I want to say a huge thank you to Seed Daily Symbiotic for partnering with me on today's video. Keeping with the theme of TMI because I've been sharing every bodily function for like probably the past year. The C Daily Symbiotic is a two-in-one prebiotic and probiotic. I've been taking it for well over a year now. Pre-pregnancy, I took it to help as I was really struggling with bloating, so it helps support ease of bloating. During pregnancy, I continue taking it because it's pregnancy and breastfeeding safe. It helps ensure that you're extracting all those micronutrients, all that good nutritional value from your food. It also supports regularity, which I got very constipated during pregnancy. That's actually part of how I found out I was expecting a baby. And I've continued taking it during my postpartum journey, again, to help with ease of bloating, support regularity, and because it's so easy to keep in my routine. It's just two capsules, first thing in the morning, no refrigeration needed, so keep it on your bedside table, even if you're exhausted, even if you're not sleeping, even if you have baby brain, just two capsules in the morning. And it's got benefits beyond just your tummy and digestion. Those are the most relevant for me because my tummy problems kind of girl, but it's also got benefits for your cardiovascular health, immune function, skin health, and more. So if you wanna check out Seed for yourself, I'll put a link as well as a code in the description box down below to save 15% off your first month's supply. Will you be sharing her name? I know this isn't technically in the subject matter of today's video, but you guys have been commenting it under every YouTube video on every IG Q&A, and I know so many of you come from a good place because I've shared so much of this journey, so it's like, why don't we know her name? And I promise I'm not doing this just to be like rude about it or not include you because again, you've been so part of this journey and so many of you have been so supportive of me. But since finding out about the pregnancy, this is something I've thought a lot about about how to navigate the online space with kids, how much privacy I wanna maintain, how I wanna set boundaries, and her name is not something I'll be sharing right now. I remember when I was a kid and I'd go on field trips or you know, I'd do some sort of activity with like preschool or school and they'd put a name tag on you. And I remember when my grandma would pick me up, the first thing she would do is she would rip off that name tag. And she told me, the reason we take off your name tag is so that strangers can't come up to you and you know, you trust them because they know your name or something, right? And when I was a kid, it seemed really silly. But as an adult, I kind of get it. And this isn't to say that there can't still be weird people who approach your kids out in public, you know, bad things can still happen. But the way I see it is if I start sharing more and more personal information about her online, you can't just take off the name tag. Like once it's out on the internet, it's out on the internet. It is hard figuring out how to set boundaries. I'm trying to navigate being so excited about this pregnancy and so excited about this journey and having a baby who I love so much, but also making sure that I'm sharing through the lens of what I'm experiencing and not making her the focal point because she does deserve privacy and she does deserve to share her identity and herself online if she chooses to share herself online, however she chooses in the future. I realize that I chose this and as much as she is my baby, she also deserves privacy. So right now, this is what feels right for me. I'm sure it's going to continue evolving, but I hope you guys understand those boundaries. This is why you'll hear me often calling her little lady or or baby or lately I've been calling her bean. We've really been going with bean in our house. I also just think it's kind of weird, like a little baby to have like a proper name. I'm like, no, you're bean. So if you guys want Selena to call her in the comments, we can go by any of those. How long was labor? Seven hours and 24 minutes. That is as per my midwives official documentation write up that they did at the end of the home birth when we were just like chilling, vibing, cuddling with the baby. That said, everyone seems to count labor a little bit differently. Some people will count the start of labor as being when your water breaks, if that is kind of the onset of your labor symptoms, my water broke when I was 10 centimeters dilated. So if we'd started counting when my water broke, my labor would have ended up being not very long, less than an hour, which yeah, that's definitely not correct for me. Some people start counting at the onset of the earliest of labor symptoms, which 
I don't think makes 100% sense because sometimes those symptoms don't progress. Like in the final few weeks of pregnancy, I was having a lot of symptoms that kind of felt like they could be labor to me, but then they didn't really progress. So my midwives started counting the duration of my labor right around when I had those big bloody shows, if you watch my birth story, and when things really started progressing in intensity for me. Can you go through each section of labor on a pain scale of one to 10? So first things first, I believe that the way you experience pain is significantly impacted by your expectations around that pain. So for me, going into pregnancy, like this was an unexpected pregnancy, I'd known that I wanted kids for a long time, but I just kind of put the pregnancy and pushing out a baby part like out of my brain because I was terrified of it. And I completely bought into like the Hollywood version of pregnancy of it being just this horrible thing. And you know, at least you get a cute baby at the end. But once you push that baby out, you just, you know, put that whole experience out of your mind because it's completely traumatic and terrible and like the worst thing you're ever gonna experience in your life. If we're looking at a scale of one to 10 with like one being nothing and 10 being the most painful thing you're ever going to experience, I definitely anticipated it being a 10. And I was trying to think of other things that would be terrible and incredibly painful to experience. And in my brain, I was like, oh my gosh, birth is gonna be on the level of like medieval torture of like the Saw series of movies. Well, I realized everyone's experience will be different. Having now had a baby, at least in my experience, it was nowhere near that level of pain. And I think shortly after having baby, I did a Q&A on my IG stories and I shared the somewhat controversial statement that I rated labor to be like a six on the pain scale, if we're considering a 10, like medieval torture. And I stand by that. That, I gave it a six based on the average of pain over the entire experience of labor and delivery. So kind of going section by section, I would say early labor when I was experiencing those rolling menstrual type cramps, I would say that's like a one on the pain scale. It's not even as uncomfortable as having period cramps because at least for me, when I experience period cramps, it's like a low, dull, achy feeling that doesn't go away. Early labor was even easier than that because that sensation would come and go. It was kind of rolling. It wasn't always there. So it was even less than like mild menstrual cramps. Once we got to active labor where my contractions were starting to pick up in intensity and pick up in frequency, and I was having to pause to breathe through some of them. At the start of active labor, I would say I was probably like a four on the pain scale. As we progressed through active labor and as we started to get to those end stages, where I was approaching 10 centimeters dilated. Yes, we definitely got up to, I'd say a six. Between a six and an eight, I'd say most of the time was a six or a seven, but toward the end of active labor, I started to let some fear into my mind because I was like, okay, well, how am I gonna know when it's time to push? And my midwife and doula just kept telling me, you'll know because you're gonna start to feel pushy. And I think a bit of that fear of the unknown of how much longer I'd be feeling this squirmy feeling, I think that started to get to me and that heightened the way I was experiencing pain. So toward the end, there may have been a few contractions that felt like an eight. Once we got to pushing, we made that transition from being like fully dilated to, okay, I'm feeling the pushy feeling. At first, it wasn't necessarily more pain. It was just like this distinct change in sensation. I could literally feel my pelvis, my bones moving because the baby was descending. When the pain started for me, I don't even know that it was a higher intensity of contraction as compared to what I'd been feeling, you know, even just a few minutes before. But I think because the sensation of pushing, like the involuntary contraction of my uterus, it just completely caught me off guard. I didn't know what I was feeling. I felt out of sync with my body. That heightened the pain I was feeling. So I'd say on those early pushes, I definitely got to like a nine. I was terrified. I was doing my best, but I was definitely in my head. I was spiraling a little bit. Once I started productively pushing, I was getting a sense of relief on the tail end of the contraction. So even though the intensity was still there because I was getting that little bit of relief and I felt like I felt the baby actually moving out, I say we probably got back to an eight. Ring of fire comes around. It might've been an eight. It might've been a nine. It was so short lived in the scheme of things. And so I stand by rating the overall experience, my personal experience of having a baby via an unmedicated spontaneous delivery. It was like a six on the pain scale. Did you poop? in front of your partner. Let me tell you son. I didn't just poop in front of my partner. I pooped in front of my doula as well as my midwife and maybe the second midwife when she entered. I'm not really sure. I mean, I wasn't like you weren't 
you weren't in the toilet bowl, but I was obviously. Yeah, you were on the toilet bowl. I was on the toilet, but it's not like you were in the toilet bowl, like watching yeah. my butthole. Remember, we all thought you had a big poop that <laughs> was your water. Right. So yes, my partner was in the room when I was pooping. But like, here's the thing. I feel like when I always thought about pooping during labor, I kind of pictured it as everyone is looking at my butthole as I am pooping, which would be a weird experience. I would definitely be like, hey, maybe don't do that. But you're on the toilet. They're not watching it happen. And I wasn't really focusing on them. I kind of created a little partition when I was on the toilet. I had like, the toilet was here and the door kind of opened like this and the bath was here. So I, I kind of created a semi partition, but I also just didn't really care. And I don't mean that in the way of like, oh, I'm just letting myself go. And that's so unsexy. And this is gonna be like a memory that haunts me. Like they're not looking at your butthole. And if they are, tell them not to. Nobody needs to look at your butthole when you're laboring. What's the breathing technique for the contractions? So the technique I used to go more gradually when I was pushing, I do believe is called gentle pushing or gentle breathing. But when it comes to pushing, you have a few options. So the first kind of point of distinction is whether you want to do coached pushing or intuitive pushing. So coached pushing is when the nurse or whoever's helping you during your labor tells you when to push and tells you how to push. They'll often say something like push like you're pooping. Whereas the other option, the alternative is intuitive pushing. And that is pushing when you feel like pushing. To be clear, your body is going to be involuntarily pushing either way. Like your uterine contractions, your uterus literally contracts. You have no control over it. And that is what helps mainly drive the baby coming out of your body. But the reason that we push is because we can give our body a little boost, help make those pushes more productive. So I did a mix of coached and intuitive pushing, I guess. Once you get to pushing, there are also different ways to push. So how you're breathing during the pushing. A lot of nurses and OBs will coach you to push like you're pooping. So take a big inhale, hold your breath and just like squeeze, push for dear life, like bear down. That was not for me. It felt like way too much pressure. It really hurt. It felt like everything was going way too quickly. And it kind of felt like I was trying to push against a wall. I ended up doing gentle pushing as this felt so much better for me. It allowed me to push more gradually and kind of go with what my body was feeling. If I needed to adjust my hips, if I needed to squirm or wiggle around a little bit, it was much more manageable for pain and pressure. So the way I thought about it and I visualized it in my head is if you think of the uterine contraction, what your body's doing naturally is being like this big wave that starts gradually, comes to a peak, then tapers off. What I would do is I would take a big belly inhale as we are coming up to the peak of that uterine contraction, I would try to fill my belly with as much pressure as possible, like I was loading it up. And then when I could feel my uterine contraction starting to taper off, I would start with my gentle pushing. So I would, instead of just holding my breath and forcing all that pressure down, it was kind of like gradually letting pressure out of a balloon. So I'd do like pursed lip, do you think your breathing technique helped you avoid a severe tear? Yes. So quick reminder from my birth story, pushing was not easy for me. I feel like I watched so many birth stories and they were like, pushing was such a relief after all of the labor contractions. No, for me, it was very challenging. Part of the reason why it may have been because while my baby was in a great position for starting labor, she was in the LOA position. If you're familiar with the different positions that babies can be in, she didn't want to rotate. She did not want to cooperate as we were descending through the pelvis, cheeky little lady. And so because of this, I do believe that had I just kind of pushed like I was pooping or just held my breath and tried to push, I probably would have gotten more severe tearing. So I did end up tearing. I did not get any perineal tearing, which I'm very grateful for. Just a bit of labial tearing from her coming out with her hand up here. And it was literally her nails catching on the way out. But no perineal tearing, no internal damage from that. Did people ever bully or pressure you about having a home birth? No, but the reason for this is probably because I shared that information with hardly anybody. Basically the only people that knew I was planning a home birth were the people who were going to be at my birth, Jeff, my doula, my midwives, and I did end up telling my mom. I did not tell anybody else about this, even my closest friends, because it was something that I was not originally planning and I was still feeling a little bit unsure about 
even as I got to the later stages of pregnancy. So I just wanted to make sure that whatever I was feeling was based on me, not somebody else's non-professional, like non-medical opinion. As I started thinking more about it, as I talked to my midwives about it, I learned a lot more about the risks or maybe lack of risks associated with home birth. If you are having an otherwise low risk pregnancy, if you have a hospital in decent proximity and you have a capable birth team, something I also didn't know is that midwives, at least where I live, have all of the same equipment, all of the same qualifications as a level one hospital. So same capabilities as a local or regional hospital where people deliver babies all the time. The only pushback and like I'm hesitant to even call it pushback I got was from my mom. I remember I was on the phone with her and we were just kind of doing like a pregnancy check-in. Like she was seeing how I was feeling, how my appointments that week had gone. And I shared with her, like, I'm like, mom, this is a crazy idea, but like, I'm thinking of doing a home birth. And she was kind of like, oh, um, she had kind of a similar reaction that I did when my doula suggested it. And I think it's just because like me, like she'd never known, like actually known anybody who wasn't on the internet who'd done a home birth. My mom had no reason to be afraid of it. My mom's always been very birth positive. Like she had good pregnancy. She had good deliveries. She did her deliveries unmedicated, minimal intervention. She was very encouraging throughout my pregnancy. But when she had kind of that reaction, like she was asking the same question. She's like, are you allowed to do that? Like, is that safe? Like, who's gonna be there? Do they have medication in case things go wrong? But as soon as I shared what I was learning with her, you know, she was just as excited about the idea as I was. She was actually kind of jealous because when she had me, again, based on where we live, they just didn't have access to nearly as many options as we do today for how and where you deliver your baby. How is your V? I always wanna ask people this, have you looked at it yet? Okay, so I love this question because this was one of my big worries postpartum. I remember when I was literally laying in bed after pushing out the baby and they said, oh, you tore, but good news, it's not a perennial tear. And I'm like, what, I tore, how, what? And they were telling me I was gonna get five stitches. And of course I was super excited to have my baby and you know, just kind of in this wild, euphoric, exhausted, dazed state. So I can say at about six weeks post having baby, everything looks normal. Everything looks not just like normal, but the exact same as it did pre-pregnancy, which makes me kind of sad. I didn't look immediately postpartum. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have, maybe it would have freaked me out a little bit because everything down there was just so sensitive. Like going pee was a task, wiping was scary. It was more like a padding process those first few days. And there was just so much swelling. Again, I think because I had very superficial stitches, they were like on the outermost portion of the lip, I think. I don't fully know because I was numbed up when they stitched it up, but everything healed. I will say I took my recovery very seriously. I stuck to my wound care like every day. I was doing a lot of resting. I was not on my feet much. I you know, didn't rush back to exercise or any of that. I wore like all the non-chafe underwear and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, still kind of weird. <laughs> Is it uncomfortable having so many people all up in your business during labor? No, but I think it really depends on who is involved and the energy they are bringing. So one of the benefits and something I feel really lucky with, with having a home birth is that there were a lot less people involved. I'd imagine as compared to having a hospital birth where there might be shift changes or just residents coming and going, a lot of people involved maybe bringing a bit of a chaotic energy to your labor. For me, for most of my labor, there were three people there. There was Jeff, there was my doula, and then there was the midwife. There was a second midwife who came literally as I was pushing out the baby, but the midwife who was there for most of my labor wasn't even from my primary care team. I'd never met her before. I guess it was a busy time for delivering babies, so they just sent whoever they had available. Regardless of who or how many people were involved though, I think that's something that allowed me to feel at ease with having so many people like like up in my business and not feel self-conscious in my body is that I made sure to create an environment where I felt heard, I felt respected, and I was able to clearly communicate my needs. That did not happen by accident. Being able to clearly communicate through something as intense as labor and delivery takes preparation. So before giving birth, I researched, okay, what is actually happening during labor and delivery? What options do I have? And as a result of that, like what are my preferences for how this will go? I didn't go in with a strict birth plan, but I made sure to clearly communicate to 
everybody on my birth team, make sure that Jeff understood, make sure that my doula understood, make sure that my midwife practiced, like not just the people on my primary care team, but that on my file, they had it written down. I want an unmedicated minimal intervention birth. Even if we transfer to a hospital, even if maybe I don't go the unmedicated route, even if maybe plans change, I still want minimal intervention. And here's what that means to me. So if I can't advocate for myself, you can advocate for me and you understand how to work with me. If there is a time to be high maintenance, it's probably when you are having a baby. Over the course of my entire labor, I had two cervical checks. The first, I'm glad I got. The second, I probably didn't need because it ended up discouraging me mentally. And then they were up in my business again when I was literally pushing out the baby. Did they need to be? I wanted them to be in that moment, but I also understood that it was an option to catch my own baby. In the scheme of things, as someone who wanted a minimal intervention, like relatively keep your hands off me delivery, I was not uncomfortable. I was pretty at ease. And I think that's because I felt that I was able to clearly communicate my needs. I felt respected in communicating those needs and I felt like we could truly work as a team. That is it for today's video. I gotta cut myself off somewhere. I always just love talking and talking and talking it with these TMI talks. I could do this all day, but I am gonna cut myself off there. Let me know though in the comments down below if you'd like either a part two, like a follow-up to this one, still focusing on birth and labor and delivery, or maybe if you'd wanna do another one on like postpartum or on home birth specifically, let me know because I do love filming these videos. I always put the question boxes up on my IG. So if you're not following me there, make sure you do. And if you wanna check out that Seed Daily Symbiotic I mentioned at the start, I will put a link as well as code to save 15% off your order in the description box down below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I can't wait to see you in the next video.